I think actually tonight's speaker is the perfect exemplar uh, of what we mean. A 72F, she has been equal parts traditional entrepreneur, startup investor, and social change uh, activist. Um, I, I saw in your, your bio that you've invested in more than 25 startups, um, including a Medsc lot of wallpaper too. <laughs> <laughs> Medscape and Affinity Labs. Uh, I, I counted four different organizations you've been CEO of, but that probably um, is not the the full list. Um, Daphne has been a campaigner for women's rights and women's entrepreneurship and women in business, uh, a, a leading speaker at the We Own It Summit. Uh, she serves on uh, the boards of organizations like the BeaconStreetGirls.com, which is committed to health and well-being for middle school age girls and Girls Learn International, promoting uh, girls' uh, access to education. Um, in our discussions, I don't think there's ever been a distinction between what you do on the for-profit side and what you do on the social venture side. It's just all one mush of activity, which I think is exactly right. We're so glad to have you here this afternoon. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Jonathan. I'm um, very, very glad to be here. And um, I'm, I'm not a big fan of speeches. I like to moderate panels and have discussions. So I'm just going to make a few comments and then hope that we can have a conversation more about sort of some of the topics that we touch on. So um, my first encounter with Hampshire was actually at the end of my junior year in high school when, um, uh, um, when I came to Hampshire as a, uh, to study microbial ecology with Lynn Miller. Uh, and uh, we made compost heaps and we measured uh, methane emissions. And um, uh, I don't know what happens here during the summers now, but I can tell you then that uh, we were kind of the nerdy kids, the whiz kids, who may be seen as cool and hot now, but they really weren't then. <laughs> uh, I thought Hampshire was awesome from the outset. Yeah, all the hippy dippy stuff, the sex, drugs, rock and roll, and uh, that came with it being the early 70s, and I was very impressed by that. But more importantly, I saw Hampshire as the place where uh, one can engage in experimentation and exploration, and that it permeated every activity. It was the embodiment of interdisciplinary thinking, and there was the opportunity to express this approach in every action and at every turn. Uh, in advance of this talk, Jonathan sent me uh, the original Hampshire course catalog, and in looking at it, it's an incredible testimony to the innovative thinking of the college's founders. Perhaps it's already been done, but it would be the terrific basis of a Division III project. Uh, in the philosophy section uh, of the college, taken from the making of the college, the founders say Hampshire's goal is to transform knowledge from the cold facts to the poet's poet, poet of our dreams, the architect of our purposes. And that purpose was pre present at Hampshire from the very beginning, and I availed myself of all the opportunities that it offered. Uh, we all did. Hampshire was a startup then, and it's, in its essence, and in institutions and culture were still in the making. I was one of the co-founders of the Women's Center on campus, the Shell Social Science Advising Center, and passionately organized my classmates to protest the Board of Trustees' investment in South Africa. Uh, the mods, or donuts as we call them, had just been built, so we started a food co-op, and some of us decided to live truly collectively one semester by moving all our beds into the double and using the singles as dressing and study rooms. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, as a last hurrah, and much to our parents' chagrin, we disrupted our own graduation to dem demonstrate for Puerto Rico's uh, liberation from U.S. hegemony. I left Hampshire with a pretty strong anti-business attitude and moved to New York. After a brief stint as an international telex operator at Barnes & Noble, which was absolutely no fun at all, I landed a job through the Village Voice an alter at an alternative news magazine called Seven Days. Uh, founded by the peace activist Dave Dellinger and a group of exploration news service journalists, many of whom went on to successful and well-recognized careers, the venture was a true startup. We developed a business plan and built sophisticated circulation and revenue projections um, <laughs> using a solar-powered calculator. 
There were no spreadsheets or computers those days, but we thought we were very tech savvy. We raised funds from socially conscious investors, worked a gazillion hours a day, and produced quite a few issues fortnightly, because despite what the title suggested, we couldn't afford to publish weekly. Eventually, the venture folded. We weren't able to scale quickly enough to support and grow the operation. I spent several years after in the magazine publishing world, including several of them putting out The Nation magazine, which thankfully still exists. Having majored in women's history at Hampshire, I decided to go to graduate school at Sarah Lawrence to get a master's degree. I quit just shy of finishing because all I could see was a career in academia, which I was certain I didn't want. This was a mistake in hindsight. There were lots of unforeseen uses for such a degree, and it was mostly my lack of imagination that led me to drop out. After some years working as a graphic designer, marketing consultant, and then publisher, I went on to graduate school at NYU's Stern School of Business. Ironic for someone who 10 years earlier had so vehemently rejected the world of business. I guess I'd grown up quite a bit and decided to get a degree if for no other reason than I could get paid three, three times what I was earning then. Thankfully, this proved to be true. It was the late 80s, and having an MBA seemed to put you in a different category. It was kind of like having a computer science or engineering degree now. Not so many women doing it, and the skills were in demand. When I was nearly done, I met my future business partner, Esther Dyson, with whom I then worked for 18 years until we sold our company to CNET Networks, which has since been absorbed by uh, CBS. We built a business publishing a monthly report called Release 1.0 on emerging trends in businesses and technology, of which there were many in the late 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Our publication was very expensive and not a household name, but we counted the movers and shakers of the technology industry among our, among our subscribers. We also produced PC Forum, the annual executive technology conference, where the industry's leaders and upstarts mixed. Think of people like Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Marissa Mayer, Sheryl Sandberg, Mark Zuckerberg, and Reid Hoffman. Also, each year we invited a few dozen early stage companies to pitch their ideas to prospective business partners, VCs, and acquirers. Who knew, th who knew then that there would be such a massive number of startup accelerators and pitch days we hear about and participate in today? Many of the country companies and entrepreneurs that became household names had their start at our conference. Eric Schmidt met Larry Page there. ICQ, the software behind uh, AOL, AIM, and online chat, launched at our conference. And Flickr launched and then was acquired by Yahoo at our event. Our gathering was the first LinkedIn for groups. As if that weren't enough, we took advantage of the changing trends in Eastern Europe and Russia in the early 90s by publishing a quarterly report on innovative technologies, by hosting an annual conference on that region's burgeoning markets and technologies, and by small, starting a small venture capital firm that invested in early stage companies in Eastern Europe. We funded the first, the first early stage, the first internet provider in Hungary, the region's first business journal, and an innovative software company that was specifically designed for the growing technical workforce in Eastern Europe. More importantly during that time, I had two awesome daughters, one of whom is here today. And from the beginning, they came to the conference, handed out swag to attendees, and took special pleasure in telling the industry's leaders what size sweatshirt they needed. It was a terrific and incredibly fun business. We prided ourselves on our business integrity, editorial independence, and status as economic and community influencers at the edge of innovation. From the first year to the last, the, we were witness to the arc of change in the technology industry, where it has gotten to now, us now and where it's going. As I said, eventually we sold our business, stayed on for our earnouts, and were lastly invited to add all the content we produced during those years to the permanent archive of the Computer Science Museum in San Jose, where it resides today. In the five years since, I've spent most of my time doing consulting, equity advisory, and board work, including a recent two-year project directing an initiative on the role of information technologies in the nation's future economic future opportunities. I'm especially interested in women entrepreneurs after having been one for so long in the very male world of technology. I do think women face distinct issues when they assume leadership roles, especially when pursuing equity funding for their ventures. Even today, less than 10% of venture capital funding goes to women-led companies, and an even smaller percentage of women work for VC firms. Change is slow, but there are now women around the country forming angel investing groups 
who are opening their wallets and adding their domain expertise to help women-led companies grow and prosper. They're driven by the data that diverse companies are more successful and that by reinvesting in other women, the balance will shift in the future. Social change can be achieved by building solid and profitable businesses. I've also taken a deep interest in entrepreneurship internationally. I had the opportunity to teach entrepreneurship and angel investing in both Tunisia and Egypt over the last year, and more recently to work with people and organizations that are trying to accelerate innovation in Macedonia, Croatia, Albania, and the Baltics. Just yesterday, I met with the founders of Flat Six Labs, a model accelerator in Cairo where I'm a mentor. The U.S. educated founders are taking all their entrepreneurial experience and computer science and engineering degrees and applying them to the MENA countries. Several of their startups are replicas of ideas that we have been developed here and are being adapted to local markets and conditions. But others are homegrown innovations that have the potential to capture global markets. It's been fascinating. Like other parts of Eastern Europe 20 years ago, walls have come down. There is a young population with a lot of technical talent and fervor who are trying to build the tools for a modern society. And there are investors who want their regional economies to grow and are concerned their local talent will flee if they are not well incentivized. Throughout the world, the culture of entrepreneurship is here to stay as the world's economy changes. As I like to say, when we were young, people graduated and went backpacking through Europe before beginning their lives. Today, they found a startup instead. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, while as in the past, as we know it, people had jobs with relatively well-defined work conditions, the future is about putting the pieces together to earn a living. Everyone's got to be an entrepreneur. As technology enables people to sell their services in small bits, like on TaskRabbit, as musicians collect revenue on their work in fractions of pennies on iTunes, and by marketing their CDs at live events. As over 800,000 sellers put their wares on Etsy, some of them successfully enough to become very large businesses of their own, and as radiologists in the US moonlight and get paid per scan to provide diagnoses to patients in Brazil, everyone's an entrepreneur. To some degree, the greatest change is the rate of change, and the only way to flourish is to embrace this thinking early on. We're all going to be earning a living, and those who think entrepreneurially and adaptively about what they are doing will be rewarded. Job fluid, fluidi, fluidity well, job fluidity means we've got to sustain ourselves as lifelong learners. Hampshire did a great job of teaching us that from the beginning, from the beginning that there is just too much to know, and that the best hope for success is to learn how to learn, how to find what we need as we need it, and to take risks, make mistakes, and ask for forgiveness later. Now more than ever, the natural spirit for exploration that is Hampshire dovetails perfectly with the spirit of entrepreneurship in which technology makes it possible to launch companies with minimally viable products that will be forever iterated. Whether it's a sustainable enterprise or social entrepreneurship, change is built into and is fundamental to success. As the course catalog so succinctly put it, quote, the first students of the college will live out a quarter or more of their lives in the morning of the 21st century. No one can tell what living fully and well will come to mean for them. We can at least guess that they will encounter more change, more options, more complex dilemmas, more possible joys, and more chance of surprise and wonder than men have known before. And then, from my perspective, perspective, the inherent tenacity and inquisitiveness that, that being a student here demands, and the collaborative and critical thinking that Hampshire teaches, are more fundamental to success than ever before, and the rest of the world is finally beginning to get it. So I like to have a conversation more than anything else and kind of hear people's questions and sort of talk and see what people have on their minds. I mean, I know Hampshire's been doing a lot in this realm and um, again, sort of more interested in the exchange than anything else and what people have on their minds. So are there questions? People have ideas? <laughs> I'm sorry, yes. Hi. Um, so, I don't really know. Like, just the one thing that sort of comes to mind is self promotion is just absolutely key. Like, yeah. you know, again, no, like, obviously, no one's going to promote you. It's really just up to you to get up there and like, 
for me to recognize your own like talent and whatever mm -hmm. and uh, just really put it out there. And well, I, yeah, and I think that's true. And I, yeah, and I think that, you know, I, I spend a lot of time um, in accelerators these days and kind of mentoring people in accelerators, of which there are many in New York. Some are, you know, uh, women focused, some are just, I mean, I don't know if you know about these, but whether it's tech stars or uh, Entrepreneurs Roundtable Accelerator, or there's a, there's a you know, um, Founders Institute, there's a lot of them around. And it's, it is really tenacity that makes people um, come forth and sort of say, my idea is worth pursuing. And a lot of times, these ideas have to evolve. They're not, they're not done in isolation. They're not done alone. They're done collaboratively. Um, surely, in those situations, having a team of people to go out there and, and promote it and say you, 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 know, you want to move forward on something is the way to do it. Self-promotion, I mean, you know, sure, we have all the tools of social media to do that, and, and we need to avail ourselves on them. I happen to be terrible at that. I don't like doing it at all. It's not, it doesn't come naturally to me to do that, but I know it's something that's a requirement just as we all become sort of more transparent. But, um, yeah, I think part of it is putting it out there in whatever version you have and then seeing what it iterates into. Um, I mean, again, like when I was in Cairo, I mean, there were companies there that, it's like, really? Uh, you really think that's going to okay. But there were a lot of smart people there and a lot of talent. And with support, they were developing their idea and putting it forth. And, and it was gelling into something that could be supported by, by peers, by investors, by a community of users. So yeah, definitely. I mean, and Hampshire's good at that, right? <laughs> that's, that's one of the things it does well. Yes, Ken? We all seem to agree that Hampshire College itself is an entrepreneurship of a kind. You've seen lots of entrepreneurs pitch their entities to you and technologically challenged, as my daughter will tell you. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hampshire is trying to pitch itself to prospective students and prospective yes. donors, as you know. You've seen a lot of what Hampshire says about itself. Would you be willing to critique us? What I'm going to say. You're willing to suck on it? Just like a. Really? It's like a camelback. Oh. Driving. Wow. Right? That's a good idea. In my career, I'm used to being upstaged by dogs. Never mind. Never mind. I'm water about this. God, that's too much work. Yeah. I'm sorry. Would I be willing to critique? Yeah, sure. As, 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 as a would-be investor of a kind with your, yeah, with your sure. children or with your money, um, how do we look to you and, and, and how do we present ourselves to you? Mm. <laughs> you mean what's my critique of how it's presented yeah. now? Yeah. Well, it's um, uh, a good question. I have to think about that. I mean, I, you know, I brought my daughters both to Hampshire to look. I have an older daughter as well who, who's in medical school now. And when she first was doing the college search, I was like, well, we've got to, let's come to Hampshire. We've got to check it out. And um, she ended up at Oberlin, which is a little Hampshire-esque, but uh, not quite. Uh, but um, I think that the, uh, in some sense, I really do think this is Hampshire's time. I think that there is uh, a public that now understands, and 18-year-olds have are self-possessed and understand and have a sense of themselves and their own determination in a way that is much more, may have been there before, but wasn't as articulated and defined as it is now, as, as, uh, as, as expressed perhaps, whether it's through social media or through other ways in which people just think it's their right to have new ideas and to put those ideas out. And so I, I think that there is a huge opportunity for Hampshire in that way. I mean, honestly, I didn't, I looked at some of the, I looked online at some of the, what the site looks like now and what it says, what its message is. Um, but, you know, entrepreneurship, I mean, it's sort of becoming one of those overused words already because it's, it's really, um, it's about, I actually think the more important piece of it is sort of what a society looks like in the future. And that, um, again, this work that I did on economic opportunity, one of the really big things that comes through is just that our lives are going to be completely different in terms of how we live and work. And I really, really do believe that those who are rewarded will be those who come thinking critically and open-mindedly and iteratively. Um, you know, we've seen that in our own lives, right? I mean, how many careers have you had? Many, right? Since you came to Hampshire. So again, we didn't know that then that we would, so it's sort of the wisdom of hindsight in some way to say, oh yeah, that's, that's the way it turned out. 
Actually, that's what Hampshire taught us to do, to sort of live this way. Now, in some sense, that's become institutionalized. And so I think there's an opportunity to sort of communicate that, that if you're a, you know, I see a lot of startups and the self-starters, the people who are taking their initiative and saying, well, I may not know how to write a business plan, but, you know, I'll go to General Assembly and their site, and I'll go to this site and that site, and I'll, you know, whatever it takes, right? And I'll just figure out how you do a business plan. I don't have to go to business school to do that. So in some sense, again, I think that underpinning is now become much more sort of explicitly uh, what it takes to be successful. And, uh, and that a lot of the interdisciplinary, you know, language that's used here is now just core to every curriculum. People can, wherever they go, sort of, you know, design their own major. I, I mean, I was struck by that, whatever it is now. Six years ago, going around and looking at colleges, and it was like going to Tufts, and I was like, wait a minute, I feel like I'm at the Hampshire admissions office. I mean, it was just sounding like that. So I think there's a certain piece of like, well, this is ours, let's own it, right? This is, we, we've been doing this forever, okay? And we got it down. So, I mean, that's a general, but certainly happy to be more engaged in that critique. If that's helpful. Yes. So as Ken so eloquently put, we're a college that has really great values in terms of self-starting, collaboration, being our disciplinary, but through your experience through accelerators and startups, what are some of the three critical things that you see that students today need to learn in a school like this to be successful, beyond just sort of those core values? Right, good question. Um, well, I, I'm, for better or worse, business skills kind of matter. Uh, I think that, that, again, if you don't see them as the, you know, again, when I came, went to Hampshire, the people who went into business or financial services, they were like, you know, and they were the people who, for whom that was the end game rather than the means. And I think that that's changed somewhat. And so, uh, you know, the reality is to capture investors, whether those are philanthropic investors or, I mean, I think philanthropy has changed too, right? People now expect there's a sort of, you know, a social return, uh, an R social ROI on their investment, even if it's a philanthropy. And so having business skills just really matters. And again, to see them as tools rather than as the sort of, you know, what I want to get up and do every day is, is one really, really important thing. I think the ability to communicate the idea uh, is really important. That's what I've seen in accelerators, that to, to really understand and be focused about what, the, what you're bringing, what your differentiator is, what value you're adding that, um, is really important. Uh, and I also think that um, there's this very funny balance, I think, from an investor perspective and, and when one meets entrepreneurs or prospective entrepreneurs, that's kind of a balance between tenacity and coachability. So uh, that there is really, uh, you want someone who's like so single-minded that I'll be damned if I'm not, you know, I mean, the Mark Zuckerberg, I'll be damned if I don't. On the other hand, that investors, that there is something to be learned from the community that you work in. Certainly in an accelerator, you want feedback from your peers and from you know, mentors and from, from the partners, whoever might be involved. So you want to be able to listen, but on the other hand, to be able to sort of not let go, as it were, right, to whatever you've really determined. Because the thing that you see with a lot of successful companies, I mean, we know it's not, it's not always the best idea that wins, right? I mean, for better or worse, you know, ask Bill Gates. I mean, Microsoft Word, it's not like everybody on the planet runs around and goes, yeah, I love Word. <laughs> <laughs> and, and more than half the planet uses it, right? But he sort of, you know, in, in my time, there was Word Perfect, which was like a great tool, much better word processor, but they just didn't market it. And so, you know, Word won. Right, and so again, it's not always the best thing that wins. For better or worse, um, that's the way it works. So, uh, I think part of that has to do with focus, and and so those, and again, I think from an investor's perspective, those are the kinds of things that investors, um, you know, people say, well, ideas are really important, but it's really the entrepreneur, and the team, which is really true. So, you can have a great idea, but if you don't have those other characteristics, then chances are, it, it'll just stay a great idea. Right. Sure. Yeah. Continuing on your, your thoughts about uh, from the investor's perspective. No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> just can't wait to talk on this. Oh, no, this was in the tone. Thank you. <laughs> a theme you, you have spoken of is the way in which there's sort of this sort of lack of initial purpose to be socially oriented that often occurs in many of the ventures that you take part of. 
And I see this actually, my mom was here in 73, mm -hmm. um, and ended up becoming a, a female uh, social entrepreneur of sorts, uh, without knowing it, when there was no label of that, yeah. but was right. always sticking to ethics, always spoke about ethics in her business, and, um, and sort of grew up in that sort of ideology. However, when coming to investing, how do you deal with sort of the ambiguity that often is goes along concomitantly with that kind of initial idea that saying, you know, it's, it's for profit, but there's this social aspect. And when you're judging, you know, a double or triple bottom line, mm -hmm. how do you then sort of create a, a system in which you can judge whether or not they need to be so aware of how social it is or whether if it is doing that social good in the end, it's not part of your investment? Well, I think there's different kinds of social, right? So there's social in terms of how you run a business, mm -hmm. okay? Right. Pay people fairly. Uh, you know, have their, their, their ideas be part, an integral part of how an environment works. I mean, I built, when I built my business, and I'm sure this is, this is part of the values I learned here, I mean, obviously it came from my parents or whatever to right, begin right. with, but that were nurtured here at Hampshire, was the idea that people should be treated fairly, all right? And so, even though I ran a profitable business and it was, it was very successful, we really rewarded our employees, we paid them really well, we, uh, I, my own management style was that as a CEO, I felt like I was a consultant, and I was there to help each of these people sort of take full responsibility for what they were doing and to help them do that best. So I was consulting them in, you know, as the publisher in the editorial department to kind of put it together in a way that, that um, was innovative and, and uh, you know, generated a 95% renewal rate at the same time, right, and did all that. So, so that was part of the internal part. Again, I, this was a business, but we were really lucky because we were at the edge of sort of what was happening in the world of technology. And so it was all innovative and it was all exciting. And it was all, um, I mean, we weren't <coughs> covering sort of deep tech. We were covering the impact of technology and on business and how that was happening. But I think that, that um, uh, it really depends. You know, I, there are investments. I mean, I've been involved in investments that have really are commercial, commercial businesses. I, I, I care about them because I think they are relevant to how the economy works, and I think they give visibility to people. I mean, one board I'm on, a company called FilmBuff. It is a director-facing site that helps the sort of nine companies that were at Sundance that didn't win, for example, to have a platform on which to sell their films, okay? So uh, we, we create <coughs> deals with participant media and HBO and all that so that this archive <coughs> of films gets sold and gets distributed and then give directors visibility so that they can see how they're making money on their products, okay? Now, you know, is that a social good? Ultimately, it's for profit. Ultimately, HBO is, you know, doing whatever. But I feel strongly that there are independent filmmakers out there who deserve a platform and deserve visibility. And, you know, it's the long tail of that, and that here's an opportunity to create something that's both profitable and then gives people the opportunity to do their art and get rewarded for it. I don't know, would you call that a single, double, or triple dot? I, I'm not sure. Okay. Does that make sense? So yeah. I don't, I, it's, again, I haven't, uh, I do other things that are strictly nonprofit, right. but, uh, you know, probably could be commercialized in some way to become more self-sustaining, perhaps, and maybe that's their future. Because I think that that <coughs> is true both for, there are groups out there, and I know there's a couple of groups in New York, for example, that teach philanthropists to become angel investors. Okay, that people are really know how to give their money away, but they don't know how to actually give their money away and expect to remain engaged and, and generate an ROI. So there, there's an opportunity there for people to, and that's certainly, some of those are just regular old businesses and some of them are a large, you know, high level of social responsibility attached to them. But again, for those philanthropists to not, I mean, it's amazing how much money people are willing to just give away and yet how <coughs> frightened and risk averse they are to invest in startups. So mm -hmm. how do you kind of bring those two things together? Does that answer yes, you? thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, based upon what you articulated or communicated about your self after leaving Hampshire, like the first feelings of going into business or joining these traditional, I don't know, capitalists um, entities, um, you made this growth over a 10 year span where you ended up with a master's in business. Um, how can we foster as an institution or as a community 
this growth or this different perspective in regards to these terms that have a lot of associations and are stigmatized and usually viewed as negative in our community? Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> it's a challenge. Uh, uh, again, I think that the more that can be done to understand that business skills are a tool rather than an end game, that, and again, I sure that requires further thinking and articulation but I, I, I um, you know everybody is in business right I mean everybody whether you have a student loan or you're right you're kind of and so I, I think part of it is you know we used to see it and in some sense it's, it's almost like financial skills you could call them right which people accept that in this day and age people should have sort of financial agility and, and, and be know how to handle their lives. Well, in some way, if you have a company or you have a, you need to do the same thing, right? And so I think that part of it, again, I, I think part of it is generational. It was just, you know, in those days, I mean, really business was, I mean, it really was bad. I mean, it wasn't, you know, the, <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a lot that was just really bad, you know, and, and um, it didn't come from nowhere. And it, again, I had the good fortune to sort of, you know, I made it a point to go work for alternative institutions. I mean, you know, the, the, this magazine, Seven Days, was founded by, you know, by radicals who had, who actually were trying to start a business to provide an alternative source of news. And, um, you know, then the nation is sort of something altogether different. So I decided to sort of use those skills, but kind of stay at the fringe for a long time. And kind of got into the mainstream through technology, which, you know, to my mind, was hugely opportunistic and for the most part, at least early on, was only for the good, all right, in the sense that it, it really wasn't like we see it now that's taking away jobs and it was creating jobs and it was creating a huge amount of opportunity. So those are the decisions I made in the context of the time that I lived in of what felt sufficiently socially responsible and yet would be entrepreneurial for me. Um, Again, I think that in this day and age, people are not as, uh, I think they understand that they need those tools in a way that's different in terms of how, but I think that the question of profitability can be defined in a lot of different ways. And so that's sort of up to you to decide as you do a venture or as you talk about it here, how to define what it means to be profitable, right? It's not, it's socially profitable. It's, it's uh, you know, radically profitable. I mean, wh whatever that might be. You were going to ask a question. Yeah, Ellis. Um, can you speak a little bit more as to what it means um, from like your experiences to be a woman in the entrepreneurial world? Sure. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of issues. It's a long conversation we could have. Um, <laughs> I think one of the challenges is that women, I mean, in what I've seen, is that a lot of times women, at least in the past, have come to entrepreneurship a bit later than men have. So, you know, it is, it is again, and, and I see this in New York a lot, it is, you know, cool for the guys to graduate from college, you got this great idea, you move to New York, you move to Williamsburg, you do your laundry once a month, and you're like, you spend your whole time just working on your startup, okay? And women are like, there's just a whole set of other issues that they're facing, all right? As even when they're young and they just graduate. But for the most part, my experience is that they come to entrepreneurship often later than men do. And by the time they do, they already have other responsibilities. So whether it be, you know, to the job they've created, they bought it, whatever it might be. And so I've seen a lot of women who are sort of in their 30s who are starting entrepreneurs and who, um, again, by then they need, they can't, you know, they can't live on nothing. They need to make some wage. They need to, and so that becomes a challenge. Uh, I also think that women are not, you know, it's just um, part of the problem, the part of the comment I made about the VC firms is because people like to be with their own. It's just the way it is, all right? So if a bunch of guys show up to a bunch of older guys who, you know, are kind of living vicariously through these young entrepreneurs and they have a lot of capital, they invest in them and everybody's happy and it's all, you know, it is harder for women to do that. I, I can't tell you how many women I've advised where they go into a VC firm and they come out and they say, if we'd only one of us had been a guy, we would have gotten a lot further, all right? That we, we were just women, we were three women, I mean, with, you know, 30 years, 40, 50 years of experience combined in the room, and they just, the guys didn't get it. Now, some of that is changing, and certainly, I've, again, I can speak better to New York. I mean, I've spent time in the Valley. I kind of know the difference, but in New York right now, it's actually working out all right for a lot of women because um, 
there tend to be more male developers than female developers. And it used to be, even five years ago, harder for women to start businesses because they may have had the business skills, they may have had domain expertise, uh, but they didn't have the technical skills. And so they would go searching for a technical co-founder. Now that's easier to find, actually, than it was years ago. And there are certain uh, areas that are in fashion in New York, including fashion technology and publishing and entertainment and media, areas in which women have been better represented uh, professionally. And so those business skills are now useful, and you just need the developer to get it built. Okay. So, uh, so again, it's a changing landscape, but I think that um, I just think it's inherently harder when you're not in the mainstream and you're not sort of, which is part of why I'm, a, I'm part of an, an angel investing group that invests in specifically in women-led companies for that reason, to create that network that then will foster that network that then reproduces itself. So, does that answer you? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes. So, um, I think that Hampshire has always been really good some aspects of entrepreneurship, but it's sort of intrinsic to our curriculum. Um, and I think that we still do it, those things, better than the competition, even though they've caught up to us in their verbiage. Yes. Uh, but um, I don't think they're doing what, what we're doing with respect to uh, fostering original thinkers who mm -hmm. build their own project ideas and supporting them in doing that. So. Um, however, now we're trying to explicitly build into our curriculum some of the things that we haven't traditionally addressed. How to monetize an idea, how to, how to build a business plan. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had a lot of students, a lot of, a lot of alumni who have been extremely successful, and, and more and more we have students who are doing that as part of their degrees, is building a product and a business plan. And so on. Right. Um, but most of us on the faculty don't really know a lot about that aspect of it. And so we've been trying to really figure out how, with new initiatives, how to fold uh, those aspects of entrepreneurship into our curriculum. And I just want to say, ask you from your experience of Hampshire as a student um, and as a successful um, person in the entrepreneurship world, what advice do you have about what aspects of that would fit organically within what we already I mean, we can't just graft a traditional business school onto, onto Hampshire. Yeah. Um, so I, I think we're all searching for the right way to, to support those missing pieces. Well, um, I think that accelerator model is really one of the ways that, that uh, again, in New York and elsewhere, that people have leveraged um, the kind of give back piece. And I bet that if you start, and I mean, whether it's this fund now that to, to sort of mentor the investors, as it were, maybe, in how to invest and what to look for in how they invest and to sort of be a kind of, you know, someone to respond. I mean, that's just one tactical kind of way. But I think that that would engage probably alum in a different kind of way, perhaps, that, uh, again, I, you know, you get invited to be a mentor to these accelerators. Sometimes it's like, gets to be, a, you know, like now I'm in this, this, this group in Cairo. I'm really interested in what they're doing. And so it will be from afar, even and when they're in New York, we meet and they send some of their, I mean, they, they have one company, for example, uh, uh, just a startup that was, um, was, that was seated there. And he has a really innovative idea about how to give feedback to developers in real time on, on phones, you know, born and bred and invented in Cairo. And now he's in San Francisco and is getting a bunch of funding. And I'm eager to help him get that done. And so, um, so there are ways to do that. I mean, I think to the extent that Hampshire people are action people, <laughs> in some way, if you give them a very specific context in which to engage them, that might, might be useful, might be helpful. Because um, again, I think it's, for Hampshire, it's the experiential part, right? So if you make it experiential for the people on the outside and what they have to bring in, that might make a difference. Um, so it's not theoretical and it's not, um, I don't know. Yes. Uh, you said you were happy not to go into academia. So are there <laughs> any uh, programs out there in either for your institutions or universities that we can learn from, that, that you know from your work? Um, there are a lot of institutions around. You mean in terms of learning entrepreneurship and all that? 
Well, I, again, I can speak most to New York, but elsewhere too. I mean, you know, you guys, I'm sure, you know, 500 startups, lean startups, right? I mean, you probably know all of that. I mean, you guys follow some of that stuff, do you? And, I mean, there, there's just a lot out there that's online, and that a lot of it comes up in California. There's, um, uh, again, places like General Assembly. There are, there are places that are now starting physical and online entities to teach people what they need, whether it's to code, whether it's to write a marketing plan, whether it's to write a business plan. There are lots of resources out there that you could like cobble from and rip off as far as I can tell, right? <laughs> and make those, incorporate those into your teachings that would be, are very practical, very context specific, uh, and that, that would probably be really helpful to people, again, as tools, not as the goal, but as tools in, in uh, fostering an idea and getting it out there and potentially fund it or whatever. I mean, I can give you a list of those if that's useful. Yes. Hi. This Hi. is probably a really crazy question. Okay. So I'm interested in the nonprofit entrepreneurship mm -hmm. And that's where I've been. Um, I, have, I guess I had never thought of them as startups, but I helped yes. create a few startups, one of whom is at Hampshire, the Civil Liberties and Public Policy Program. So I'm listening to you, and a lot of our students that's what they end up doing. They mm -hmm. end up creating social justice, social change <coughs> organizations in their graduate schools or in the world. So I'm listening about the angel investors and I'm trying to think about, because I think all the time about how to make our organizations more sustainable, not always give the hand out to the foundations, yes. which may not have, uh, they not always, they, they swing a lot in their yes. priorities. And I am concerned about the justice piece, like not every, idea that needs to come to the world gets to come to the world because it, for whatever reason. So do you see a bridge between the angel investing world and the nonprofit entrepreneurship? Theoretically, yes. Yeah, I no, mean, really. <laughs> 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 um, uh, <laughs> well, I think there are, um, I do think that there are organizations, I mean, one of the ways that, of course, organizations do that is to kind of repurpose the content that they've created, mm -hmm. right, and make it available to others mm -hmm. so uh, that it gets its own visibility and becomes sustainable in its own way. I mean, that's a kind of common way of doing it. Um, and if there is something sort of <coughs> pretty proprietary or unique about something that's happening here, that might be one way in which to, to I mean, monetize, but to subsidize and sustain it. Um, is to share it and you know uh, it's interesting because an example using like something like General Assembly which did raise money and but is you know I don't for those who don't know it's kind of a New York lab uh, it's an incubator space originally it had a bunch of startups in there as well as classes that they were teaching and uh, they are now doing away with all the incubator and only doing the education piece and have really have you know now there's General Assembly in Berlin I think in London and and so what they've done is sort of you know this idea that that um, uh, that you're, you you can repurpose what you've done and make it available to others, and really make that sustainable. I mean the same thing is true. So this angel investing group I'm involved with, Golden Seeds, we've um, it's kind of an interesting story because it's made up a lot of, of women and and men as well investors who, but many of them came from financial services, so they were kind of inherently risk adverse. And you know they're just investing other people's money, but not their own. And so they, you have to sort of teach them the principles of angel investing. And what happened is that because it's sort of a you know group of very disciplined people, developed a curriculum that's like angel investing 101, 201, you know everything from writing a term sheet and doing due diligence to all that stuff, through to board governance, for example. And um, the, the work that I've done in Tunisia and in Egypt teaching is using that curriculum. Now this is an angel investing group that exists to invest in companies, but we've actually taken this curriculum and now sold it, as it were, not sometimes it's selling, sometimes it isn't, they pay for our way, but there's an opportunity there to actually formalize something and that others need, and you're sort of saving them you know, from starting from scratch by sharing those principles with them. So again, that's just one example of something that might be a way to sort of take pieces of what's done here that are unique and are, you know, uh, future thinking in a way that some of these other institutions maybe haven't come to yet in some way, and to sort of externally 
leverage them in a way that both builds reputation and makes it sustainable. I mean, again, require more thought, but it's one way. That Just one little yeah. thought. So, but if the return on investment is not money, yeah. but is a social good, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, I mean, obviously, that's the sort of you know we're over in the realm of philanthropy. But I guess I'm sort of thinking about is this all? Are these are there investors out there who would actually think in those terms? Maybe. I mean, I could imagine there might be among some Hampshire alum even who might think that way about about how to to uh, you know how to leverage it in some way that goes beyond itself, as it were, right? Which is sort of what we're saying. Exactly. It's on fundamental. Yeah, thanks. Sure. Yes. I was wondering if you could speak to your experience uh, leaving the workforce to start your own venture, kind of um, taking a leap of faith and the Yeah, so I guess I sort of always did that in some way. I mean, I never, the most sort of corporate time I spent was when my company was acquired and it was a publicly, and I was interested in that. I mean, part of it is when we had suitors, I was very interested in selling to a publicly traded company. We built a subscription business where people paid for their content and here was an advertising-based business, and I thought that was really, really would be really interesting. It turned out that it wasn't all that interesting, and yet, you know, <laughs> advertising and online advertising, it's like you think, oh yeah, people would be really smart, and it's like dumb and dumber. I mean, it's really, it's sort of, it's, it's actually painfully shocking, okay, how not innovative a lot of it is. But be that as it may, you know, suddenly I was like, you know, Sarbane Oxley, and I was kind of concerned with reporting and ways that things that, I, so I learned a lot doing that. But I've always kind of made my choices. And in fact, by the way, you know, I'm like trying to figure out what I'm going to do when I grow up right now. I mean, I'm <laughs> trying to figure out what, <laughs> what I'm going to do next, OK? And I'm, I'm sort of getting a little, uh, frankly, I feel like a dilettante at the moment. I mean, I've spent my life sort of building things and feeling. And now I feel like an influencer, but I'm not, I'm not, taking, I'm not responsible for it. And I've sort of been accustomed to that. So I'm, I'm actually doing my own thinking right now about kind of what do I want to do for the next piece. And, um, and, and I guess for me, it does need to be something that is, um, I mean, it needs to be financially rewarding at this point because of obligations that I've had and responsibilities and expectation. And, um, but it also needs to feel like it makes a difference and it's big enough to make a difference. And that's always been true. And so that hasn't changed. That's kind of the theme throughout that. And if, um, so, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I mean, I may even go work for a big company, but it would be to do something that I thought was going to somehow impact that and, you know, move the dial a little bit in some way. So, does that answer? Yeah, thank you. Sure. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah. No worries. Um, I, I mean, I really believe that Hampshire is um, a very unique sort of education system in terms of how it builds people that can pitch themselves, you know, throughout the educational yeah. process and stuff like that. Um, and I think that I've had a lot of conversations with people who are interested in entrepreneurship, but sort of outside entrepreneurship, maybe you know Peter or a lot of other yes. a lot of other places um, that aren't quite sure how to how to bridge that gap that, that they see as being a gap. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, about how to kind of come to a place where you feel comfortable selling yourself. Um, and I think that that's a big sort of concern um, that I've had about about sort of Hampshire students that they're very you know very innovative and you know create plans and pitch themselves to people. But when it comes to actually saying, well, now I need money for this, like you know, right. I don't know if you have anything to say about that. Uh, yeah, it's hard to ask for money. It's really hard. I mean, some people don't find it hard. I think that you know, some people don't find it hard. But I think it's hard to ask for money. And I think um, I just want to make one. I'm happy to answer your question. I just want to make one side comment, which is, I'm not saying, you know, by the way, that every, everybody doesn't need to found a company and start a company, okay? I think that, that I will tell you this, that as an employer, and I tried to, my, as my daughter knows, and shared this with her and her friends ad nauseum, is that I, is that in terms of having been someone who's hired people, okay, that uh, the thing that matters is to hire people who are, you know, really work hard and are diligent and all of that, but who are, take responsibility for what they're doing and uh, are thinking all the time about ways to do it better, okay? And that that, now you could call that entrepreneurship, right? You could say those, I mean, those are inherent characteristics is to sort of demonstrate leadership and initiative and responsibility. And those are all things that you can't be a good entrepreneur if you don't do those things, right? So, uh, um, or not a long lasting entrepreneur anyway. So. Um, so I, I, again, I don't. It's not that one needs to always be 
you know, the founder, you might be part of a founding team, or you might be, right, you could start a theater with a group of people. You don't have to be the one who, you know, now invests it. Uh, it is hard to ask for money, but I think, again, that, that if one sees this as a means to something, then it's easier to think about it that way. I mean, it can't be done without it. Uh, those people who can do it without it are extremely privileged. And, and it should be said, and it's true, that in the world of entrepreneurship, there are disproportionately a number of white, educated men doing this work, okay, who ha have a fallback position if things don't work out. And that's, that's the truth. And anyone tells you otherwise, it's bullshit, okay, because it's just the way it is, and it's disproportionately represented that way. But again, that doesn't mean that if you, with a group of people, don't have an idea to go out that, again, money is the means to do it. And you, it's a matter, you know, part of what the internet has done is made it a little bit more transparent, right? So that, you know, whether that's a Kickstarter, kind of the buyers and sellers can find one another, as it were, or a quirky where you can sort of develop an idea and get an audience and buyers before you actually manufacture. There's just, there is a transparency that's there now that with some work and connections and this and that, you know, and kind of working it through, you should be able to find a match that works for you. So, harder in the arts, for sure, than in technology. No question. Yes? Could you talk a little bit more about your experience with nonprofits and ideas for creating a sustainable um, model for a nonprofit organization? Well, um, yeah. Uh, so my most active right now nonprofit activity is I'm on the board of an organization called Young Audiences, Arts for Learning, which is a national organization that's been around for a really long time. Uh, and uh, it's an affiliate network of 33 chapters around the country that are arts or local arts organizations, some of which are called Young Audiences, or some of which are not. And they're all part of this affiliate network. And with uh, the coming of a new director, uh, the, uh, I've been on the board for three years and spearheaded the sort of um, website redesign and all of that. And so now we're trying to create a platform. As, as a national organization, we're trying to act as the advocacy, sort of marketing and advocacy group of the sort of STEM to STEAM movement, as it were, right? That, which is actually also quite related to Hampshire. The idea that, that uh, you need the A, the arts, creativity in order to actually, I mean, STEM is China, STEAM is the US, right, as it were, to really make it so crudely simplistic, but uh, mm -hmm. that, you know, but that there's an opportunity and that creativity and teaching creativity early on to middle and elementary school kids is a huge part. And it's not about, it's not about how creative they are, it's about values, which again, I think work very nicely here, which have to do with you know, for the most part, arts is around collaboration, it's around people working together, building ideas, um, following through, practicing, learning, you know, doing all of that. So those are all things that you get to do in a creative environment that are actually great tools for later big picture critical thinking. So, um, but one of the things we're trying to do <coughs> is to, again, take advantage. So we have like groups all over the country doing this work. Well, how do we sort of leverage the network, as it were, so that best practices that are being done by a dance teacher in Tucson can be applied and, and they don't have to recreate the wheel, they can share best practices and kind of create a network that goes within young audiences and beyond. So that's not a profitable model, but it is a way to build greater sustainability and efficiencies that then allow people not to you know, waste their time on sort of figuring out how to do the next fund. I mean, there's, that's both true from the arts part, from the administrative part, where, you know, you can kind of create templates of how to do a fundraiser <laughs> so that you don't have to each time start from scratch and you can share best practices. So I think that's true for a lot of nonprofits, that there's an opportunity to sort of enhance sustainability by using those efficiencies. And, and you know, we see that a lot, right? But I, I, I think it's probably something that could be better applied to a lot of nonprofits. If I'm hearing you co co correctly, what that I'm hearing is that classroom can teach the uh, tools, but really it is the culture and the values of the school that really, pr really pr pr promotes entre entre entrepreneurship. So A is, do you believe that thing? And if so, what are the downsides by making that being the uh, culture? What are the risks? 
yeah. Well, to 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 a school, who's saying that is our value statement in, in some respects. Right. Um, so. I think I need to qualify it a little bit. So in terms of the tools, you know, you all know what Khan Academy is. Right? So, you know, no, so Khan Academy was a guy who um, had cousins or nieces and nephews who wanted to take the SATs. And so he kind of put all these courses online to learn, you know, all the stuff, the declarative learning that you need to take the SATs. And then it, it sort of went viral, and he started basically what is now, I, I don't know how many thousands, I think it was last I heard, it was like 3,000 different courses that are online where you can learn the tools, declarative learning online. And the whole idea there is to flip the model, right, so that you can actually gain, you can create, ironically, at scale, customized learning. You can go at your own pace. You can do declarative learning using, leveraging technology on your own, to then use the classroom as the place where you have dialogue. So the classroom isn't really the tools, as it were, right? The classroom, so you can all go off and listen online to some general assembly, blah, 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 about how to, you know, how to whatever, write a term sheet or how to write a two-page summary for your business plan. But then go into the classroom and get the dialogue and critique. But you're saying beyond that, I think, the culture of the institution and how that I'm not sure I know the answer. I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things and dangers, of course, with entrepreneurial, I mean, people think, you know, the reality is the success rate of startups and companies is like very, very, very small. Um, but, and I think that there are ways to do it in a way that, again, are about, um, that go beyond entrepreneurship as we know it, go beyond starting a company, starting a nonprofit, starting a theater, but are about, I mean, I think what is persistent is that culture of taking those ideas and having them permeate, permeate whatever it is you choose to do. So I, I'm, not sure what, I'm not sure what that would result in or how that would sort of, rather than opening the opportunities, narrow it, if that answers your question. I mean, kind of, I mean, I'd have to give it more thought, honestly. I'm hopeful that that's the answer. <laughs> that's the answer to it. I mean, again, I, I think, you know, the, the reason I made the comments about the international stuff is because the reality is that, you know, this is happening everywhere, <laughs> everywhere. Whether it is, you know, you know, micro economies and, and women making, you know, stuff in Africa or whether it's, it's large scale development projects, everyone is thinking this way. This is the way people who see change are thinking. And, um, uh, you know, some have the tools to make the, the, the basket but don't know how to sell it. Some people know how to sell it but they don't know how to make the basket. So uh, it's, it's kind of, I don't, I don't think there's a downside to it. I don't, I don't think it's some, I mean obviously now, you know, for example, I mean in New York there are more accelerators. There are far, far too many of them. Okay? I actually want to sort of start the, the accelerator of accelerators because I think that that's, you know, like everything else, right? It goes like this and it's like, there's this team here with this idea and this, and it's like, you know what? You can just put your egos a little bit aside and come together. There's actually a huge amount of talent here, and you would actually do something truly effective and disruptive. But you have to convince people of that, all right? That they're, that they're not building features, but if they came together, they could actually build an awesome company with great products. So, um, but, but I, um, again, I think that those values are here to stay for a while. Uh, I do think so, and I think that, uh, um, I think what one thing that is true of this generation in a way that may be slightly different than us, I mean, maybe we were the beginning of it, but I think that it is natural for people now to think that they're iterating all the time. And that's not going away, right? So, you know, so I make the comment to these Egyptians that a lot of their com the things they're starting there are like crowdsourced platforms. Uh, and I'm like, really? Like in Egypt, really that many people are sort of into this idea? And he'll say, well, no, not enough yet, but that's going to happen really fast. That change is going to happen really quickly. So, and they obviously are in a position to ride it out now until there are enough users to warrant a product like this. Again, it doesn't seem like it's part of the culture, doesn't seem native to it. We'll take laws and IP law change and all sorts of things to make these things open up, but it's, it's going to happen. It can't, it's not going to go back. So, you know. Yes. Um, in response to the references to your work in Europe, um, 
I was curious about how those experiences informed your ability to work as a marketing consultant and um, how that just kind of informed your ability to do work holistically. Well, uh, again, I think, that, I think those places have been really of interest to me because I think that they are places where you see change is really evident and sometimes it's happened really quickly. So I'm attracted to that because you can kind of, you can, you can do little and make a big difference. So that's been kind of appealing, I think, in terms of, um, I, I, I think that the, the um, I think in some sense it's been helpful in terms of just having sensitivity to the idea that um, you can't assume that the ideas that you have here and the culture that you have here is how ideas are going to get adapted elsewhere. So, you know, you've probably heard this example, you know, that, I mean, in Egypt, there's 85 million Egyptians and 3 million of them use uh, credit cards. <laughs> so it's just like, if you think that, just that very thought, there's a gajillion things that you wouldn't create there because they're just not going to happen, right? But of course, on the other hand, cell phone penetration is really high. So now suddenly, you know, just building stuff for mobile is the way to go. I mean, payment systems, right? And ways in which people will never, ever have a credit card. They won't need to have a credit card. So you'll kind of leapfrog an entire generation of installed base and infrastructure because people are going to just start behaving in this other way. This was really true in Eastern Europe when we did our work. We got there and it was like, you know, you had all these in the U.S., all these big computers and installed bases. And here you went to Eastern Europe and they had nothing, right? They had like pens and papers. And if they were lucky, they had calculators. So suddenly you could put in Poland, if you were, you know, a German businessman or, I mean, compacted this, they went all over Eastern Europe and they sold computers. And suddenly Eastern Europe had far more, its installed base of computers was far more advanced and had all the best modern, most contemporary tools, unlike the installed base in the United States. So again, there's, you know, if you think about what, what the culture is that you're in, what its limitations are, and then kind of how you can jump to the next thing, it's kind of exciting. It's pretty exciting to think about. How do you account for these cultures? Like I don't know, if I were to leave and go to another country and like I wanted to work as a marketing consultant, how might I attempt to account for this culture that I've now just immersed in? Account for it in what sense? Like, if I'm going to implement like a new campaign, I can apply, or I can attempt to apply the knowledge that I have as an American from California. Well, you go there and you'd be really humble and you pay attention and you listen and you ask a lot of questions and you don't come to conclusions that what you know and how you do it is the way they do it. And I mean, I think it's through observation a lot that you come to discover what people, you know, how they think the way you do and how they don't think the way you do and what they're looking for. Um, you know, again, the places where I've done this work, people are really eager. There's a huge amount of local technical talent. They're just dying to figure out how they can get deployed. Some of them are dying to figure out how to get rich, but a lot of them actually really just want to build their economies, their regional economies, and are really committed to that. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs>